Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the uh, invitation. Thank you so much, Avi, uh, for having contacted me for your invitation. Thank you also to Ricardo and also to Yemen, Mr. Andreu Basols. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's also, uh, I would say, a very tricky uh, issue that I'm going to uh, tackle uh, in front of you. I've been told, actually, that there are, maybe I'm wrong, but um, that there are some American uh, citizens or students, you know, here uh, in the audience, and uh, I'm glad, actually, if there are some of them, actually, because it's an issue which also regards, I would say, uh, you know, a trend which is gradually consolidating also in the United States, not readmission. This is not uh, how you... Uh, you call it, uh, you refer actually in the United, Sta in the United States to uh, deportation. But in the jargon of, let's say, our uh, EU, European uh, officials, actually we more often than not talk about re uh, readmission, i.e. the removal, the process uh, through which uh, a person is expelled, is removed from the, the territory of, um, of a country, of a destination country, more often than not clearly. And that person actually is removed or expelled uh, because uh, from a legal point of view, uh, he or she has no longer uh, the adequate conditions to, um, you know, to stay or to reside in a, in a given uh, destination country. Uh, the title of my presentation, presentation actually will, uh, is very clear. I will focus on Tunisia on Tunisia's cooperation on readmission with the EU member states. In other words, uh, I will explain to you uh, what have been the drivers for uh, the cooperation for Tunisia's willingness, let's say, uh, to uh, cooperate on readmission with the EU member states. This is a very uh, sensitive uh, issue from a political point of view, but it is actually extremely important to understand what are the drivers and also what are the clear implications for uh, human rights observance. This is a key issue which, uh, in my opinion, is too often, um, I would say, overlooked in current uh, migration talks. And perhaps the uh, last and the most recent uh, radical transformations which took place last year in the Arab world in many countries, but specifically and first and foremost in Tunisia, uh, will allow, uh, let's say, um, decision makers, stakeholders, and so forth to maybe think differently. But to do so, actually, some preconditions have to be respected. And I will also explain to you what are these uh, preconditions in order, let's say, to place uh, human rights observance uh, in the field of so-called migration management at the center of policy attention and also at the top of, uh, let's say, the hierarchy of priorities that has shaped to date uh, migration talks. Last year, uh, on, in April 2011, uh, Tunisia concluded, maybe some of you are aware of that, Tunisia concluded a bilateral agreement uh, based on a, memor on a memorandum of understanding with Italy aimed at, let's say, facilitating the uh, expulsion of uh, Tunisian nationals. Those Tunisians, certainly you heard about those who came actually uh, to Europe and at the, at the risk of their lives, and who actually were apprehended, put in detention, and the Italian government decided, asked actually the uh, Tunisian authorities, uh, the post-revolution, uh, ref yeah, after the, 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 the revolution, in a way, the Tunisian authorities to uh, cooperate, to enhance the cooperation on the expulsion of Tunisian nationals. In other words, what the uh, Italian authorities asked Tunisia was to um, uh, accelerate uh, the procedure aimed at redocumenting uh, its own nationals, uh, nationals who were actually undocumented. And as maybe you know, in order to expel or to remove a person, or oh, by the way, you certainly noticed that I never use the word return, having worked for many, 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 many years on return migration, I know that actually uh, this, I mean, we should uh, call a spade a spade, and uh, expulsion or removal is expulsion and removal. Return is another issue, it's, it's a stage in the migration cycle. 
even if I'm sure you heard about you know, return policies, well, in my opinion, these are not return policies. These are policies aimed at expelling, at removing unauthorized uh, persons. So during my presentation, and I hope during the debate, please do not use the word return. Uh, call a spade a spade, and again, if, you, and, and if we have to speak about readmission, it is a readmission. Readmission is a form of expulsion, uh, just like the removal of a person anyway. So let, let, let's, let's go back to the issue with Tunisia anyway. And the, I, the idea actually was to accelerate, uh, to speed up the redocumentation process of these people who arrived, who crossed actually the Straits of Sicily, uh, and arrived on the island of Lampedusa and also on the coasts of Sicily. Uh, it's important to understand, you know, how things work properly because in international relations, it's, imp it's absolutely important to understand that it's impossible to expel a person just because you don't want that person to, uh, you don't want that, that person on your territory. And above all, when that person is undocumented, in other words, there is no ID document, and not at all, nothing at all. So uh, you need actually what is called a travel document or uh, a laissez-passer. And a laissez-passer is delivered by the consular authorities of the requested country, in this case Tunisia, clearly. So the idea was to ask actually the consular, uh, the Tunisian cons consular authorities in Italy to come directly to a detention center in Lampedusa or in Sicily or elsewhere and to, um, you know, to speed up the identification process with various uh, methods through an interview more often than not. And then the consular official uh, delivered a travel document, which is a sine qua non if you want to expel a person. So actually, it's, a, well, it's quite interesting to see that this agreement, which was uh, concluded in April uh, 2011, was not the first agreement uh, that was concluded at a bilateral level between Italy and Tunisia. And this is actually what many people did not know. Actually, uh, this is the fourth agreement which was uh, concluded at a bilateral level between Italy and Tunisia. So your question would be, but why did Italy ask for a new and a fourth on top of that agreement dealing with, you know, uh, the removal of uh, you know, uh, Tunisian nationals with the issue of readmission. Well, um, to understand uh, the reasons for which actually Tun uh, Italy asked for a fourth agreement, you have to consider, or I would say, you have to disentangle the issue of migration from, uh, you know, uh, the so-called migration management framework. Uh, to understand mi migration, you have to go beyond migration issues. You have to deal with uh, you know, um, a broader framework of interaction at a state-to-state -state level, clearly, which includes uh, many other issues and even many other strategic issues um, which actually codify the cooperation on readmission. Let me explain to you what I mean. Readmission is part and parcel of a broader framework of interaction between two countries at a bilateral level, let's say. But I, we could talk about the EU. I think I won't have, have time, actually, to talk about the way in which the EU, at a multilateral level, supranational level, actually, deals with readmission. It would be too complicated. We can maybe do it even during the debate, if you wish. I have no objection. But the fact is that today I would like to focus only on the bilateral cooperation on readmission, saying that it is part and parcel of a broader framework of interaction between two countries. It is also shaped by all the strategic issues, such as, let me give you some examples, the fight against international terrorism, energy security, uh, a reconciliation process. Spain is a good example. We go outside the Tunisian case now. You know, Spain and Morocco. This is a very good example of how two countries in... Uh, during the early 1990s, decided you know, to cooperate on readmission following a treaty of good, uh, um, how do you say, of good neighborliness, you know, uh, between Spain and, uh, and Morocco, which dates back to 1991. Afterwards, in the wake of this treaty, well, there have been a great deal of 
uh, agreements, among others, and uh, I repeat, among others, one which dealt with readmission. You have to consider that, as I said to you, uh, to understand the conclusion of, of such an agreement is one, one thing, but to understand its implementation over the long term, it is another thing. Just because, just to keep on, you know, this uh, example between Spain and Morocco, which dates back to 1992, uh, this agreement, yes, was concluded in February 1992, but it has never been fully implemented. This is absolutely important to understand that the concrete implementation of an agreement, but this is not new at all, you know, in international relations, you know. There are many agreements which are concluded and which are never fully uh, implemented. And the one between, uh, just, between just a, uh, you know, a short uh, digression in a way, but uh, the one between Spain and Morocco was, could not be implemented just uh, because of, I would say, um, you know, um, of severe, uh, of, well, of, a, uh, of difficult uh, diplomatic relations between the two countries which after uh, which, in the, as of the late 1990s, started, you know, to um, to jeopardise the corporate, the effective cooperation on readmission. Um, that's it. So the idea, again, to understand the reason for which Italy asked for a fourth agreement, again, you have to take into consideration all these, you know, complex issues which go far beyond. Uh, you know, the so-called migration management agenda. Um, actually, the first agreement which was concluded between Tunisia and Italy dates back to uh, 1998. This is important uh, to be aware of the existence of this agreement because, because this was actually a standard readmission agreement. Let me explain to you in two minutes what is a standard readmission agreement. A standard readmission agreement is an agreement which specifically uh, mentions all the internationally recognized standards uh, related to the protection of human rights, uh, the protection of the uh, you know, fundamental rights of a person who are uh, readmitted. Uh, a standard readmission agreement goes through, uh, well, I, more often than not, it goes through a lengthy a ratification process in Parliament, um, which clearly uh, impacts, you know, on uh, the extent to which the agreement will be, well, concretely implemented once, um, one, once ratified, actually. So uh, it is an agreement which al also goes through uh, a debate in Parliament. It is more often than not publicly, uh, um, well, it is it is not beyond public purview. It is, you know, accessible in official bulletins. You can even download uh, the text of the agreement more often than not on the internet. Uh, well, you can have access, you know, to all the rules which are included in this uh, standard agreement. Uh, the rules also including the, for example, the documents that will be taken into consideration in order to, act, well, to identify a person. You know, uh, uh, so sometimes you have a, a driving license, which is mentioned as, you know, a substitute for an, for an ID, or uh, even sometimes in some, uh, in some agreement you have, you know, the, um, the, um, a certificate of border crossing, which is uh, considered as a proof uh, of uh, identity, uh, you know, in order to redocument the person. The big issue in readmission is always uh, the redocumentation. When you speak with officials in most uh, EU member states, I'm not talking about non-EU uh, countries, but in the EU member states, in Brussels also, the big issue is how can we decrease the cost of detention and expulsion? They don't talk about human rights, they don't talk, they are not really worried about the, 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 the fate of the persons, you know, after the expulsion to a country which more often than not has not uh, the institutional, political, structural capacity to guarantee, to ensure, uh, well, the safety and the dignity of a person who, 
who is uh, readmitted. Uh, Libya is a good example. Tunisia uh, is a good example. Uh, Tunisia has no asylum system. Uh, this is a, an issue which has to be uh, tackled in the sense that what can you do? You know, what about the fate of these people once they are expelled to countries where there is no asylum system, there is no clearly a set uh, legal system aimed at protecting the fundamental rights of a person who is readmitted. You know, uh, this is an issue which is more often than not overlooked in migration talks. And when you go to Brussels, the main issue is to decrease the cost of detention. Just to give you an idea, per day, per capita, it goes from 60 to 100 euros. It's a lot of money, clearly, I agree, but the big issue, in my opinion, is not about money. It is the way in which we uh, comply with the principles uh, of uh, the EU Charter uh, of Fundamental Rights, which dates back to 2000, because we are EU member states, you know, and this is a principle which is enshrined in the Treaty, in the treaty of Lisbon. And this is something really serious, which the, the, it's not only, uh, sorry for maybe, it's not peanuts, <laughs> it's very serious. It's, some, it's, a, it's part and parcel of our principles. And this is part also of the external action of the EU, where uh, uh, the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights is absolutely uh, a key document which has, which has to be taken into consideration. This was, again, repeated last year by Mr. Barroso uh, as a result of the uh, Arab uprisings, uh, saying that the EU will uh, pay more attention to its mission, you know, in protecting the rights of, uh, uh, of people, you know, in, uh, in the EU, but also outside the EU, in, the, in its EU external action. Well, I think you know, it's important today if we really mean to, um, well, to give, uh, um, well, m well, the right importance, you know, to the Charter of Fundamental Rights, I think, you know, reconsidering the way in which readmission is dealt with in migration talks, but also at an EU level, would be a very positive sign. Uh, I will tell you what I think about it at the end of my presentation and what are actually all the implications of these uh, um, of these aspects, anyway. So, uh, I was, uh, before, I, I was mentioning uh, the fact that cost is a big issue in migration talks. And as, as I'm sure you understand, when a standard readmission agreement is concluded with all, you know, the, uh, the stand, with all the, uh, uh, well, the uh, international um, uh, treaties that have to be taken into consideration regarding the protection of the rights of the persons, etc. There is also another aspect which is part and parcel of a cooperation on readmission. Reciprocity is mentioned in such standard agreements. On the paper, it makes sense, but in practice, it's extremely difficult to understand how a readmission agreement can be based on reciprocal obligations. Let me give you a logical example. When there is an agreement between Spain and Morocco, I'm sure you can expect that there will be certainly much more Moroccan nationals in an irregular situation in Spain than there are Spanish nationals in an irregular situation in Morocco. This is logical. So, despite, you know, the reciprocity which is enshrined in each standard readmission agreement, in practice, actually, this is a reciprocity which is unbalanced. So, that's why, actually, in 2010, I, uh, well, I wrote, you know, this book uh, with other colleagues explaining, you know, the incoherence which is already part, you know, of such agreements. So, uh, you know, uh, this has been a big issue in the sense that, okay, there is a reciprocity, but in practice, actually, we can't, uh, uh, we can't respect, you know, the, the uh, well, the principles, the principle of reciprocity, which is part of our mutual reciprocal commitment. And in fact, in 1998, when uh, Tunisia concluded its first 
readmission agreement with Italy. It was not the first readmission agreement that Tunisia concluded, because the first one, maybe few people know that, but the first one dates back to 1965. It was concluded with Austria. Yes. An agreement with Austria, a standard readmission agreement. I have few information regarding, uh, I have little information regarding, you know, the, uh, the concrete implementation of this agreement. Because when you have to know whether the agreement is, was, or not implemented, you have to obtain data through, let's say, well, channels or networks, and it's not that easy, anyway. So the role of a researcher is to collect this information, which is totally beyond public purview. It's extremely tricky for a, for a policymaker to admit that actually, yes, there is an agreement, but it doesn't work, you know. So uh, this is another aspect of the cooperation on readmission. But let's go back to the issue of implementation. I was speaking about the 1998 agreement, and this agreement actually, well, has never been fully implemented, just because, as I've just said, there are unbalanced reciprocities. Tunisia has always been reluctant to cooperate fully on um, the removal of its own nationals from Italy. The same goes for France and Tunisia. In 2005, uh, the French government faced with the, with the reluctance, this is the word actually of a um, foreign minister at that period, Mr. Doust Blasi, who criticized uh, overtly uh, Morocco and Tunisia, saying these are two countries which are extremely uh, problematic because they do not re-accept you know, uh, their own nationals who are apprehended on our territory, on the French territory, okay? And we want, actually, these people to be expelled from the French territory. To do so, we need a travel document. But the consular authorities, actually, uh, were more often than not reluctant to deliver, you know, this uh, laissez-passer, this travel document. And just to give you an idea, I have here a very interesting graph which, uh, make, which makes a distinction, you know, between, and it's, it's essential in a way, it's actually the number of laissez passes delivered by Tunisia at the request of France from 2000 to 2009. Uh, here you have a volume of uh, the laissez passes which are requested by the French authorities, and in white you have those who are, which are delivered at the request, of course, of the French authorities, okay? So you can see the difference, and you calculate a ratio, uh, which is called actually a delivery uh, ratio, and it's extremely interesting. As I was saying to you, the French minister, and it was in 2005, uh, referred to the, to the French parliament, saying, Mr. Douste Blasi said, more or less, well, no, I'm quite satisfied, because in 2004, and for the whole year in 2005, we exerted pressures, diplomatic pressures, on Morocco, on Tunisia, in order to make these countries more uh, responsive to our uh, requests in terms of enhanced cooperation on readmission. In other words, we want actually to Tunisia to be, you know, more responsive to our um, to our um, request regarding the delivery of uh, uh, laissez passes okay. okay? And it's interesting because, you know, with hindsight, once you get, you know, the data, of course, this was in 2005 and nobody had the data, uh, and we had actually to believe the foreign officer, you know, um, uh, Mr. Duster Blasi, in saying that, well, you know, the, de the delivery ratio increased uh, substantially from 2004 to 2005, and he did, he's right. But this is, as I'm sure you understand, due uh, to the fact that the number of uh, laissez passes requested by France substantially decreased. So it's a mathematical logic, you know, of course the ratio will increase if Tunisia remain more or less on the on the same position, I would say, you know, actually nothing really changed in terms of responsiveness from the Tunisian consular authorities. But just, you know, the number of requested uh, laissez-passer 
decreased. So this is an anecdote, but it is important to understand, you know, uh, well, what is behind, you know, this, uh, this official statement which was made at the, uh, at the French Parliament, just because it gives you an idea of how it is politically sensitive when you speak about readmission. For a foreign minister, it is extremely uh, critical to show uh, that actually his policy, his action works. And, um, you know, arguing that, you know, uh, an, uh, well, uh, a third country is more responsive gives, you know, the idea that actually you have the right policy, you know, to propose to your own uh, uh, to your own uh, counterpart, in this case, uh, Tunisia. Uh, you have to consider that, well, you know, on an average, the, uh, uh, the delivery ratio is more or less of, well, between France and Tunisia is around 25% nowadays. And the same goes for uh, Italy and, um, and Tunisia. Uh, unlike, by the way, the, the case of Algeria, and Italy, in terms of comparison, it's always interesting. The, deli the, de the delivery ratio is only 2%. So out of 100 requested laissez-passer, the Algerian consular authorities just give two laissez-passers. So you, I'm sure you understand how um, controversial this issue is in terms of, well, uh, well in the field, well, in, in, current, in current migration, migration talks. I'm sure, but these are data which more often than not are not publicly um, um, disseminated, actually. And you have to do a great deal of research, again, having access to, you know, data and statistics through, well, interpersonal networks, uh, ch uh, people you know, etc., who in the end give you the data you need. And you have also uh, clearly to well, to compare the data you collected from all the sources, anyway. But how can we explain, just to give you an idea, that Algeria is not responsive, you know, to the uh, requests uh, of the Italian authorities? Well, again, to understand all that, you have, as I said before, to put this cooperation in a much broader framework of cooperation. I will explain to you what are the drivers for the cooperation on readmission in five minutes only. Before, I would like to, sh to say to you that faced you know, with the reluctance of many um, Mediterranean countries to cooperate on the tricky issue of readmission, of expulsion, some EU member states, particularly Spain, uh, France, the UK, uh, Italy, Greece, um, among others, started over the last 15 years uh, to uh, design uh, new types, new patterns of cooperation on readmission by relying on non-standard agreements. And this is again in the, uh, in the text which maybe was, uh, was sent to you, the one on unbalanced reciprocities, where I explained actually that you know, there are these uh, non-standard agreements which actually uh, have been devised in order to address the need for flexibility, which is a key issue in the cooperation on readmission. Again, we have to speed up the cooperation. Um, uh, the faster, the quicker, the better. I don't know how to say, you know, just because you have to decrease the costs of detention and of expulsion, anyway. Uh, and the other issue is operability. This is the new fashionable word, which has been introduced, by the way, uh, by uh, the uh, European Commission over the last, I would say, mm, over the last 10 years, more or less. In order to speak about operability, it's a way of, you know, saying that, well, uh, we want to cooperate on readmission. We are aware of our duty and obligations, you know, to, um, well, to abide by internationally, internationally re uh, rec recognized standards on the protection of human rights, etc., and refugee protection. But at the same time, we have to make the cooperation more operable. And the notion of operable is extremely 
um, controversial. First of all, because in my opinion, it is hardly compatible with the effective respect for human rights. And this is not only my opinion. This is also the opinion of the Commissioner for Human Rights at uh, the Council of Europe, Mr. Thomas Hammarberg, who is a well-known person, certainly, uh, I would say a key uh, figure, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, the, uh, well, who is extremely proactive in the defense of human rights uh, uh, um, in the countries uh, uh, who belong in the 47, if I'm not mistaken, 49, I don't know, uh, countries of the, uh, who, are, who belong to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. Um, he has been extremely critical regarding the policy of the Euro uh, European Commission. And in denouncing in 2010 um, uh, the, uh, the danger of the notion of operability. First of all, because it is extremely vague. And second, because this is a notion which tends to overlook uh, the, uh, well, the duty of each member state to respect the rights of individuals. But there is, in my opinion, more than that behind the introduction of the notion of, oper of operability. Uh, operability, actually, and this is no surprise, responds predominantly to uh, security concerns, uh, to the need for flexibility. We, well, we cannot agree more uh, on that. But it's, it's, it is also responsive to a kind of hierarchy of priority. Uh, a hierarchy of priority is extremely important for policymakers in order to recognize that each policy issue has its own meaningfulness and its own policy relevance, but there is an order of priority. And in the European Neighborhood Policy, which was, which was uh, you know, introduced in 2003, 2004, have you ever heard of it, by the way, the uh, European Neighborhood Policy? N no? Uh, you know, it, 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 well, it follows, well, it complements, at least, you know, the Barcelona. I mean, we are in Barcelona. <laughs> so, you, should, you should know it. You know? <laughs> well, it well, it complements, you, know, um, you know, the Euromed Partnership. Uh, it was a way of reactivating, you know, uh, Euromed relations. And the uh, European Neighbourhood Policy was uh, adopted in 2004, and it was based on action plans at a bilateral level, uh, concluded between the, well, the EU, the European authorities, and a non-EU, well, and a third country. This is a non-EU country, if you prefer. Uh, the uh, European Neighbourhood Policy in 2004, when it was introduced, actually, is, in my opinion, a full reflection, you know, of this hierarchy of priorities. And let me, let me explain to you why. In each action plan which was drafted at a bilateral level, and even the action plan which was, which was adopted uh, for Tunisia in 2004, uh, the, uh, you know, the ENP Action Plan for Tunisia, this is how it was called anyway, there was an array of issues which were, uh, which were, con which were considered, among others, uh, well, um, privatization, uh, in uh, enhanced liberalization, um, um, uh, the expansion of the private sector, reforms in the judiciary, uh, of the ju judiciary, uh, judiciary system, uh, there were also uh, whatever, um, well, the, the respect for the rule of law, um, cooperation, uh, technical assistance on border controls uh, um, and migration management, etc. There were, you know, many issues which were considered and which were all viewed as priorities in the action plan. Well, of course, when you speak about so many priorities, you cannot imagine that each priority will have the same uh, importance or relevance, okay? Inevitably, and uh, in the long way, uh, you, you start to build a kind of hierarchy of priorities. And clearly, the issue of security started to, well, to stand at the top 
of this hierarchy of priorities, you know, control of borders, migration controls, the fight against uh, international terrorism, all this was part of the action plan also. Reforms in the economic system, privatization, liberalization, etc., etc. So these were priorities which were viewed as being uh, extremely important in the hierarchy of priorities, and also human rights were mentioned clearly in the hierarchy. But certainly, at the, you, you, you consider that you know, they are not at the first or second or third uh, position, but certainly at the fifth or seventh or eighth position in the hierarchy of priority. And this order is extremely important because it shapes your policy, your, your, well, your policy options inevit inevitably. It shapes also your own subjectivities. And this is extremely important even in migration talks. When you give so much relevance to security issues, it is, there, is, <coughs> sorry, there is no surprise that in the end, at the end of the day, well, you know, migration are viewed exclusively through, through the prism, uh, you know, through a, a kind of filter, which, which actually, uh, well, create categories of thought which at the same time orient your own perceptions and subjectivities. And this is also what policy making is all about. It is about subjectivities. You know, what is important to you will certainly not be necessarily important to me. But when we, the EU and its member states, when we have the same hierarchy of priorities, which is, you know, codified in the European neighborhood policy, inevitably we tend to lead to a form of consensus building. And this is extremely important because it shapes again your own categories of thought, your own perceptions, your own priorities. That's why actually readmission continues today in the framework of the uh, EU-MED relations to be well, one of the key aspects of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, relations between the EU and its member states, on the one hand, and non-EU countries. Last year, uh, after um, the, uh, well, after January 2011, one of the main priorities which was considered by Brussels was, among others, to encourage, I quote, to encourage non-EU countries, the Arab countries, you know, uh, to, uh, in, their, uh, in their effort, you know, in, uh, on their way to democratization, etc., and the respect of um, uh, freedom of speech and expression, uh, fundamental uh, rights, etc., good. But in the field of migration management, we would like also to propose to these countries, the, you know, the implementation of mobility partnerships. Well, the idea for those who are maybe not familiar with mobility partnerships, the idea may sound a good idea. But when, when you know that mobility partnerships, which, is, which are actually, uh, which, which stem from the uh, global approach to migration, which was adopted in late 2005, and which was, among others, driven by the issue of enhanced cooperation on readmission, and by the way, mobility partnership are conditioned, are conditionally linked with the uh, conclusion of a readmission agreement, you know. So uh, you understand that maybe the proposal fr uh, from the uh, EU authorities wa was not maybe the most ideal proposal that a country uh, which is discovering, you know, uh, well, freedom of speech and democracy, which is leading uh, towards, you know, uh, a process of um, de democratization. Well, the offer which was put on the table by the uh, uh, European uh, uh, authorities was maybe an offer with a double-edged effect. On the one hand, yes, we will promote the mobility of specific categories, specific categories, of labor migrants, not everybody, don't believe that everybody will be able to go to Europe, certainly not. 
specific skills will be uh, proposed you know, in the mobility partnerships, and these skills are specifically mentioned in the mobility partnership. Not all the EU member states will take part in the mobility partnership. This is another issue that not everybody knows. So um, it's not because the EU will conclude the mobility partnership that all the member states will have to you know, respect the terms of a mobility partnership. Often people think that you know, everything is decided at the level of Brussels. It's always Brussels, the EU, etc. Well, I would like to tell you something. You know, in the field of migration management, I hate this word actually, but in the field of you know, the control of migration, of international migration, well, bilateralism is predominant. It's not the EU. So you, you will tell me, well, come on. But as far as I know, uh, as far as I know, uh, well, the EU negotiates and concludes readmission agreements with some, well, well with many uh, non-EU countries. I say, yes, I know. But actually, the implementation is only and exclusively bilateral. The role of the EU institution, the role of the European Commission, if you prefer, in this field, is only to facilitate the cooperation. But the, the concrete implementation is bilateral. How? Through what is called an implementing protocol. And it's extremely important to know that. The issue in the field of readmission is not about the agreement per se when it is concluded by the EU, for example, with, uh, uh, you know, with um, Moldova, uh, with uh, Ukraine or Russia, with uh, some Balkan countries, etc. It's not that. It's the implementing protocol. You have to have access to the text of the implementing protocol, which is beyond public purview. This is another big issue in terms of policy transparency. You know, so you have an agreement, which is the first facade, where everybody can have access online. You go on the website of the DG Home, and you have access to the text of the agreement. Good. But this is actually more often than not a standard agreement. Well, something classical. We all know more or less the contents of the agreement. But when it comes to knowing when it comes to knowing you know, how the agreement is concretely implemented, you need to have a protocol. But to have a protocol, there are strategies. Either you contact the authorities of the uh, non-EU countries, and you say, well, I would like to get you know, this uh, implementing protocol, which you concluded with Germany, with France, with Italy, with whoever. You know, again, as I said to you, it is bilateral. So there, there may be 27 implementing uh, protocols, because we are uh, 27 member states the, in the EU, clearly. So uh, it, it's important to be aware of all that, uh, because it gives you an idea of all the intricacies which are, which are be behind, you know, the concrete cooperation on uh, readmission, okay? Um, I would like to now to explain to you what are the drivers. This is what I would like to do, and I have actually, I think I have 20 minutes which are left if I may, because we started later, do you mind? Or oh, 15, a quarter of an hour. I try to be very, very short anyway. Let's be very short. I told you about the existence of two types of agreements. You must be aware of how these work. Why do some countries conclude standard readmission agreements, whereas others you know, tend to conclude uh, non-standard agreements like memoranda of understanding, a pact, uh, Spain, uh, lights, uh, you know, these are flexible agreements, just like Italy or France also. Um, so it's interesting to see what are the factors, you know, that shaped, that shape, sorry, the quid pro quo, the, uh, the way in which the cooperation is codified to some extent. Let, this is part of the book, but I would like to anyway show it to you again, if some of you maybe did not have a look mm -hmm. at it anyway. This is, you know, uh, just for... Uh, there is a domain which has to be taken into consideration. When I speak about a domain, I mean that there is not one factor which influences your way of cooperating, but there are many factors. And it is actually the combination of such factors which impact on the, conf on the, conf on the configuration of the cooperation. The first one is, as I'm sure you would understand, it is geographical proximity. It is clear that two countries which have a common border, will certainly 
have a higher propensity to cooperate on re-emission than two countries which do not have a common, uh, a, 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 well, a common border. But well, this does not work everywhere because the cobweb of agreements uh, on readmission is so big today. Just to give you an idea, at a global level, as far as I know, between the 27 member states and the world, you know, we have more or less 350 agreements. It's a lot. It's a lot of agreements, of bilateral agreements. And it shows again to you clearly that bilateralism is predominant, despite the action of the EU, which tries anyway to harmonize, that it's extremely difficult to harmonize your own migration policies when you have 27 visions of how migration should be managed or monitored anyway. There is a second factor which has to be considered in order to know well, to, to understand why, you know, uh, there is a standard uh, agreement uh, on readmission, it is what, why, what I refer to as migration salience. You don't see clearly on the screen, maybe. It's not easy. But anyways, what I mean, let me explain to you what it is. It's a notion which I tried, anyway, to uh, introduce in order to show that uh, two countries which, in, in history... Uh, and perhaps because of their colonial past, uh, have been in the history characterized by uh, the recurrent and frequent uh, interchange of people, you know, uh, between the former colony and the former colonial power. Well, this memory, this historical, historical memory of mobility might actually have a disruptive, a negative impact on the propensity of a former colony and a former colonial power to conclude a standard readmission agreement. Why? Just because a standard readmission agreement is extremely tricky from a political point of view. It is extremely unpopular. And on top of that, when it is standard, it is Visible. I told you before that you can download, you can have access to the text, you know, of the bilateral standard agreement. And so, you know, well, it's, a, it's an issue which, from a political point of view, will be extremely sensitive because of a memory of history. In 2002, just to give you a concrete example, Tunisia uh, was asked by the French authorities to conclude a standard readmission agreement under the Raffarin gov government. Tunisia rejected, saying, well, this is like you think that you are uh, the new, again, the new colony of Tunisia. And in the press, President Ben Ali was extremely proud to show that to defend the, you know, the dignity of Tunisia and of Tunisians, Ben Ali actually rejected the offer, uh, you know, from France in concluding re a, re a standard readmission agreement. This does not mean, of course, that Tunisia does not cooperate on readmission. It does, of course. But I mean, from a public point of view, it was extremely sensitive to show, you know, to, uh, to the Tunisians that actually, uh, well, the Tunisian authorities, the Tunisian government accepted, uh, you know, uh, to uh, conclude a standard readmission agreement under the pressure of the former colonial power. So, as I said before, migration salience might have a disruptive, a negative impact on your own, cap on, on the propensity of two countries to conclude a standard readmission agreement. And there is another one, which is incentives. I'm sure you heard about, you know, compensatory measures, incentives. Spain, for example, paid a lot of incentives to Morocco in order to induce Morocco to become more cooperative on the readmission of its own nationals. How? Through foreign direct investments, by conditioning development aid, by, you know, technical, providing specific technical assistance to, uh, to the law enforcement authorities in Morocco, etc., etc. There are many types of incentives. But in practice, incentives do not always guarantee the cooperation on uh, readmission in, in the long run. Anyway, it's extremely difficult and it's expensive, you know, also. Because 
sometimes you have non-EU countries which tend actually to ask for what is called in the jargon of, for overcompensation. You know, we want you anyway to, well, we want Spain to again give some money. We want Italy to give again more money in order to induce us to be more cooperative. But again, incentives are not necessarily, you know, uh, the panacea for um, uh, effective cooperation on readmission. These are the three main factors which shape positively, negatively, whatever. But anyway, this is the domain of the cooperation if you want to understand the propensity of two countries in concluded uh, standard readmission agreement, which is visible, uh, which is visible, and which also requires a lengthy ratification process, but which might also be subjected to reneging. This is also another issue, anyway. I told you before that there is another type, which is the non-standard agreements, which are uh, linked to readmission. Well, in this case, clearly, yes, geographical proximity has its own importance or relevance in the analysis, in understanding the domain of the cooperation and readmission. There is migration salience, but in this case, it will, uh, it will uh, impact in a very different way, in the sense that, okay, yeah, uh, well, T Tunisia was asked in 2002 to conclude a standard readmission agreement, 2002. But then, in the end, what you must know is that in April 2008, France um, proposed actually a new version of the cooperation, and it proposed actually a non-standard agreement linked to readmission, which is actually a pact for the management of international migration, for the joint management of international migration and co-development. Co-development is a typical French word uh, that we hardly understand sometimes, you know, because everybody has its has his or her own understanding of what is co-development anyway. But the idea was that this was, in April 2008, an agreement which was concluded between uh, uh, France and Tunisia. It was not a standard readmission agreement. It was an agreement linked to readmission in the sense that there was just, you know, an article in the, in the agreement which specified the idea that well, the two countries will cooperate on the effective, on, on the effective removal of unauthorized illegal, uh, in the text, migrants. Um, clearly, in order to implement all that, you need the implementing protocol. Again, you have an agreement, but you need the implementing protocol in order to understand how all this operates. You, know, you have the text, but you, know, you need, anyway. So this is the other issue, again, Having the implementing protocol from the French authorities or the Tunisian authorities is a big challenge because it's not easily uh, accessible and this protocol is not always, um, well, it, it's not necessarily publicly uh, disseminated anyway. So I, th I think you understand that in the case of a non-standard agreement, migration salience, the extent to which you know the history, uh, you know, the fact that two countries have had in history, uh, well, you know, uh, intense inter-exchanges of uh, people, you know, uh, crossing the border, etc. This may have, in the case of non-standard agreement, a certain, well, I would say, it may shape the propensity of, an indi of, of two countries, of two state actors, to cooperate on, well, on the basis of a non-standard agreement. There is also another aspect, which is the empowerment of a solicited country. In the case of, uh, in our example, it would be Tunisia, for example, which has been empowered, for example, as of the early 2000s, when, and you must know that, when, for example, uh, it has uh, been, uh, well, it has uh, accepted to play, uh, you know, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to become a strategic partner in the reinforced control of the EU external borders, in the sense that uh, the Tunisian authorities, as of the early 2000s, started to be aware that, the, uh, that their proactive involvement in the reinforced control of the EU external borders could turn, actually, uh, their, um, uh, their own position into a strategic uh, position in migration talks. 
when I need to control the border, I cannot control the border only from my side. I, al I also need your own uh, cooperation. And if we want actually to make sure that people won't cross the border illegally, the control has to be made at both sides of the border, clearly. So in, in so far as I need your cooperation, for me, you become a strategic partner. And many countries actually have become aware in the southern uh, part of the Mediterranean that, you know, the need for, uh, well, the, well the, uh, the request, you know, uh, for uh, being more uh, involved in the uh, control of the EU external borders could turn such countries into strategic actors. This is an observation which, which holds for Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Morocco, clearly, of course. Also Senegal, for example, because we, you know, we have the border of Europe is and the Canarias. Uh, so it's, it's also there. But also in the east, eastern part of Europe, Ukraine and Russia, they are viewed as strategic partners, just like Libya was mentioned in 2010 uh, in the Stockholm, uh, Stockholm program. It was mentioned as, it, as a strategic partner for the EU in its attempt to control the, its external borders. And the cooperation of Libya was viewed as being a key element you know, in this attempt to reinforce the control of the EU uh, external uh, borders. So these are you know, the main factors which shape the cooperation, this is a domain, as I said before to you, there won't be one factor which will shape the cooperation. There will be, you know, a domain. Uh, for example, for non-standard agreements, mainly geographical proximity combined with the empowerment of a solicited country, which will be reluctant to cooperate on the basis of a standard agreement because it's visible, it is unpopular, it is tricky to some extent. It's politically sensitive. So what will we do? We will simply cooperate on the basis of a memoranda of understanding, which is not a standard agreement, of an exchange of letter, of a pact, uh, an administrative arrangement. Uh, Italy uh, likes a lot administrative arrangements. They don't go through you know, uh, the scrutiny of uh, the uh, Italian parliament. And every, everything is done at an intergovernmental level between, for example, the Minister uh, of the Interior in Italy and the Minister of the Interior in, uh, in Libya. And the agreement, for example, of 2009, the uh, Treaty of Friendship, you know, involved not only uh, the, the Italian authorities, but more specifically afterwards in, in the implementing protocols again, the, um, well, the ministers of the interior uh, in, um, in Libya and in, uh, and in Italy. The agreement which I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the April 2011 uh, agreement which was concluded uh, between Italy and Libya, was also a kind of intergovernmental agreement, I would say, based on an arrangement, an administrative arrangement. This is how it is called. It was called, anyway. Uh, and which uh, actually uh, was uh, concluded between uh, the former minister, the then minister of the interior in Tunisia, Mr. Habib Sid, and uh, the then minister of the interior in Italy, uh, Mr. Maroni, uh, Roberto Maroni. Uh, so uh, this is an agreement which is, which is still uh, valid, anyway, which is still in, in force uh, between, um, between Italy and, and Tunisia. And it is extremely controversial because uh, it gives the idea that, you know, the priority of ensuring operability and flexibility stands at the top of this, you know, hierarchy of priorities. Last year, in September 2011, uh, again, uh, Thomas Hammerberg, a commissioner for human rights at the Council of Europe, denounced the uh, implementation of the April 2011 agreement between uh, Italy and Tunisia, saying that accelerated procedures, in other words, let me explain to you technically what it is, when a co uh, uh, an, official, an official from 
the Tunisian uh, consulate goes to Lampedusa, Lampedusa and, identify, and identifies a person as being a Tunisian national. Well, this procedure, based on unclear, unclear criteria, has to be clearly monitored. And this is what uh, Thomas Hammarberg rightly denounced last year. Last year, September 2011, long after, a long time after, you know, the enthusiasm um, of uh, the uh, Arab uprisings, you know, at the beginning of 2011, etc. I think it's important to realize uh, what is going on because it gives you the, the idea that anyway, well, bilateralism will remain uh, predominant in the fight, in the so-called fight against unauthorized migration. By the way, readmission agreements will be viewed always as the main tool to fight against unauthorized migration. I think it's interesting to uh, hear or even to listen to policymakers, uh, you know, who uh, argue that we need readmission agreements to fight against illegal migration. There is no uh, evidenced correlation between having an agreement and fighting, fighting against illegal migration. Uh, it's not because you will have an agreement that you will be more able to fight against illegal migration. If fighting against illegal migration means that you have to remove people, but in my understanding, and maybe in the understanding of many other uh, people, but not only researchers, but also EU officials, because it's not, you know, we are not talking about a homogeneous group of people thinking the same way. There are increasing, there are increasingly, you can meet and speak, in, and more, and it's more, uh, very, very often you can speak today with people starting to, you know, question, to, to question, you know, these, uh, these predominant schemes of understanding as applied to uh, so-called management of international migration, saying, well, well maybe, you know, it's, it's, we have to admit that it's uh, the failure of a development policy also, which is behind it. It's poverty, it's political and economic differentials and resilient political and economic differentials between the North and the South of the, of the Mediterranean, which also, you know, have to be tackled if we really want, you know, to respond to unauthorized migration. It's not only a question of security. And this is also what is going on. My conclusion, just to finish up, will things start to change as a result of the radical transformation which are taking place nowadays in uh, Tunisia? This is a big question. Perhaps someone, uh, well, will criticize me say, saying, well, it's not, well, it's uh, easy to speak when actually we know very few things, you know, it's, we need actually more, more time, certainly, and I would agree on that. But I would say that, well, they, there, there are, in, well, incipient signs of things which are changing in, in the way, at least from the Tunisian perspective, last January, just to finish with a positive note, last January, yeah, we can, uh, the state, the first state secretary uh, for uh, immigration and uh, uh, for the Tunisians living abroad was appointed. His name is uh, Hossein Jaziri. Um, I met him uh, late last month, in late uh, February, and I had the opportunity to speak with him anyway. And I think it's quite interesting what, he, what he's trying to do. Uh, I was speaking with a man. Uh, I was speaking with someone who has just arrived, who has just been appointed at the head of a big institution, uh, and uh, which is, by the way, under the aegis of the Ministry of Social Affairs, because you have to be aware that migration issues are managed by the Ministry of Social Affairs uh, for historical reasons. Anyway, in Algeria it's different, in Morocco it's also different anyway. But anyway, the idea is that, is that, is that Mr. Jaziri uh, is trying actually to, uh, mm, to, uh, to make the Tunisian institution to speak with one voice. Just because the issue of migration has been scattered, 
uh, all of our various ministries, ministries of the inter Ministry of Interior, Ministry of the Economy, Ministry of uh, Social Affairs, I said to you, and also what is called the Office des Tunisiens à l'étranger, which is the agency for Tunisians living abroad, which is in Tunis, which was actually the political arm of the Ben Ali regime, uh, well, until recently. Now, they, they, there, there is a gradual transformation of all these institutions anyway. But what he has tried to do is very important, in my opinion, and it is concretely observable. So maybe for you it will be extremely symbolic, but politics is full of symbolism, and symbolism has its own importance. He, Mr. Jaziri, he put on the website of the Ministry of Social Affairs hundreds hundreds of pictures of Tunisian nationals who lost their lives crossing the Straits of Sicily. In other words, uh, um, the, um, desaparecidos, people who we, we don't know where they are. We don't know whether they died. We don't know they, whether they are still in Europe with another uh, identity. They don't want to be uh, identified. We don't know anything about these people. But when you see on the website of a public institution. It's not an NGO, it's not an association, it's a public ministry. And when you have hundreds and hundreds of pictures of human people, human beings, you know, uh, who are very young, you know, with the names, the date of birth, and also the last place where we think they are, believe me that it gives another idea of how Tunisian is trying to um, well, to better defend its own interests and own priorities, even if these priorities, even if these, if these interests might be in stark contrast with those of Italy or even the EU or France, etc. You know, so something is happening. What? Precisely, I don't know. It's too recent, but something is happening. There is also a, a strong cooperation with civil society organization, which he has tried to promote, and a lot of associations aimed at defending the rights of migrants. Lawyers have mobilized in Tunisia to defend the rights of Tunisians in detention. This is important. Before 2011, the Tunisian authorities never cared about these people, you know, they were just a problem, you know, in the attempt of a regime to appear as a stable regime, as an example, you know, of openness and etc., etc. It was against, let's say, the propaganda to uh, unveil uh, the uh, ordeal of these people living abroad, anyway. And for the first time, a government is trying to care for them. This is extremely important. It's not enough. And I agree with you, but it's a first step. The second step, what is it? It's also, it is, of course, to build your own knowledge, to build your own counter knowledge. You cannot stay in Tunisia having your own ideas and beautiful ideas without collecting your own information, without building your own counter knowledge in a, at a time where predominant schemes of understanding as are, as I said to you, shaped by a hierarchy of priority where security concerns stand at the top of a hierarchy of priorities. The idea is that if you really want to change and to think differently, you will have to reverse the hierarchy of priority, in my opinion. I'm not an idealistic person. I think that this happens. It may happen. It's a question of strategy. We can use the word. It's a question of knowledge. It's a question of counter knowledge. It's a question of also of um, um, uh, you know um, of the extent to which you will be able to uh, uh, to to speak with uh, how would how would I, how would I say I don't find the word you know of uh, when you are respected you know in asserting your own vision you need information you need knowledge and you need authority you know you need to be authoritative. That's a word in English, I think. You know, you have to acquire an authoritative uh, position in migration talks. So far, Tunisia has never acquired an authoritative position. But maybe things, ch things will change. 
This is a process, so that's it. I would like to finish with this positive note to say that, well, you have predominant schemes of understanding. Yes, they exist. It's very important to recognize them. It's very important also to undo uh, the, uh, well, the, the construct. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Thank you.